If you're raising the premium product in your market, how do you stand out and be the premium product in the customer's eyes? How do you communicate to them that your product is better than somebody else's? One of the things I'm talking about in this episode with farmer Paul Grieve coming up. Welcome to Grassfed Life. I'm your host, Diego, D I E G O. In today's episode, I'm talking to farmer Paul Grieve of Primal Pastures. Paul is one of the people responsible for taking Primal Pastures from a very small enterprise that was started on a whim on a weekend for about $2,000 to an enterprise that now raises thousands and thousands of chickens each year and produces hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in sales each year. One of the ways that they've been able to grow and sell as much as they have and be as profitable as they are is because of marketing. And Paul's really the person who's helped spearhead the marketing campaign for Primal Pastures. This is actually a replay of an interview that I did with Paul in the past. It's a few years old, so it's slightly dated, but the information is actually very relevant. And it's going to have its place in a podcast mini-series that I do with Paul. Because what you're going to hear today is where they were a few years ago, and what you're going to hear coming up in a few weeks is where they are now. So you're going to hear the before and the after, the growth trajectory, the curve, and how it's all advanced. After hearing this episode, if you want the opportunity to learn more from Paul, you can do so at the upcoming Growing Your Farm Business Mastermind Workshop here in Southern California. It's going to take place in late March. You can find out all the details on that at grassfedlife.co. The workshop's going to be very unique because this isn't something that Paul or Primal Pastures does any time or really have ever done in the past. They're going to pull back the curtain and show how they've grown their farm to be as big as it is today. They're going to go over how they manage production, how they've grown production, how they market, how they aggregate products from other producers because aggregation is a huge part of their business. And they're going to give you tools, tips, and ideas that anybody could use and put into use right away. If you're at all considering growing your farm beyond just the small scale, check out this workshop and I guarantee you'll get your money's worth. Learn more at grassfedlife.co. With that, let's jump right into it with Paul Grieve of Primal Pastures. Paul, you left a pretty high paying job in the OC to run Primal Pastures. What was the attraction to leave the corporate world and go to farming? Oh, man, that was one of the biggest decisions of my life so far, deciding to hang up a nearly six-figure job and and head for something completely unknown. Uh, I always knew I wanted to do entrepreneurship. That was always definitely in the forefront of my mind. So I was working as a certified public accountant, um, CPA, and it just wasn't fulfilling me at all. It was an ultimate desk jockey you know, sitting inside of a cubicle and working behind a laptop all the time. And when I got bit by this food bug, uh, I knew I wanted to do something. So whether it was doing a restaurant or some kind of a mobile app related to food, or like I ended up doing starting the farm, I knew I was going to jump ship and, and do something, no matter what it, what it cost. So you're making a, a good chunk of money, and then you went into a new business of farming. And any new business, the startup phases are going to be really slow, and that probably means you're not getting paid. How was the transition of taking the salary away and moving into farming? I know you started it on the side, but when you eventually stepped out of that accounting job and took on working just at Primal Pastures, how was that period? What was really interesting, I mean, we knew what we were getting into. And I think a lot of times folks will approach starting a farm like it's entirely different than starting any other business. But to me, um, there's more similarities than there are differences. So you have to be able to project what that cash flow looks like. If you need to take a salary off of your new business within the first couple months, that's really going to restrict the capital that your business has to grow. And so by saving up some money 
and also won a grant through uh, one of the university programs that I was working with. Uh, I was able to go a year without taking any salary, working full time. Now, that was a lifestyle adjustment big time, and it took a huge commitment from my wife and our family. Uh, we moved in with the in-laws. Uh, we totally tightened up the expenses. We got really serious, and we were spending, you know, a quarter of what we were just on regular life, on life. But it was our passion, so it was like it was like totally worth it. Um, but we really did go about a year without taking in or any salary at all uh, off of the farm. And the way that was done was, you know, since I did have a full time job for about the first year that we operated the farm, um, I was able to save up some money there. We reinvested all of our profits. We haven't taken any investors. We don't have bank loans, no debt on the books, none of that stuff. And that's all attributable to being able to work a full time job for the first year that we started the farm. And then for the second year, uh, did need to take a salary off the farm, which made it really, really good because we were able to reinvest those profits, grow the farm, get the infrastructure that we needed to be able to generate legitimate cash flow and now pay uh, both my brother-in-law and me uh, full-time salaries. So you saved up and kind of prepared for that transition. And we've talked about this in person, this early stage of any business and how as a business owner and an entrepreneur, you navigate through those early stages where even if you have money saved up, you still, I think, feel the pressure of a wife, a kids, life changes. I see those pressures on a day-to-day basis while you're putting out all this effort and work into a business and the cash flow coming back from that business can be slow. It's this dip or this chasm in the early stages. And I think that's when a lot of people throw in the towel and give up on business how has this early stage been for you, and do you think you're out of that yet? I mean, I was just going to say, I wish that I could say, like, oh, back in the early days when times were really tough, this is how it was. But really, we're still down in the trenches. I mean, I'm not anywhere near near making what I was back in the corporate world or any of that stuff. I will be the first one to say my lifestyle is a lot better and things are a lot more fun, although I'm working more than I was before. But it's been a transition, man. And I'll be totally honest with anybody listening is that, you know, my wife, as much as she loves the food movement, she's really, really into the food that she puts into, you know, our our family's body. You know, this farming is not her passion. That's not what she wants to get up and do. And it's not really um, that interesting for her. So I've had to have her support from the beginning, but I've also had to balance that, you know, this is My passion, the farming things, really my passion, sustainable, regenerative agriculture is where I'm coming from. But I've got to balance that with the with the work life balance. I know my wife doesn't really care about it that much. I mean, it's definitely not her passion like it is mine. So it's been a it's been a a challenging road for sure. And that's one of the dynamics that, you know, I've heard Jill Salatin talk about a lot is, you know, the, the best asset that you can have is a wife that's totally into what you're doing. Well, in my case and in a lot of people that want to start farming cases that I talk to, that's not always the 100% truth. And I don't think it really needs to be. I mean, it, she's been 100%, 1,000% supportive. Uh, she left, you know, Orange County and moved out to Riverside County, which has basically moved from the beach out to rural farm country. And uh, it's it's taken a lot of support from her. But at the same time, it's not like this is her complete 100% passion or anything like that. I totally feel you on that because I'm in the exact same spot. My wife is totally supportive of what I'm doing, but it's not her passion. It's mine. And a lot of times it's tough for me to to go out and try and do this and put the work in and, you know, know that there's kind of this added pressure of this is my thing. She's being supportive of what I'm doing. And it sometimes takes time away from her And one thing I constantly struggle with, I don't know if you do, is when you're an entrepreneur, you're kind of in this circle where you have the pressure of you need the business to succeed because you want to go out and support your family and your kids. But at the same time, you also have to take time away from your family and your kids at times to make the business succeed. So I I struggle with those kind of guilt tugs a lot in trying to balance that all out. Yeah, absolutely. I'm in... Um, my MBA program up at UCLA right now, and I do a lot of entrepreneurship classes. And one of the things that they say are, first of all, never start a business while you're in school. 
Next, always start it while you're single because, you know, you're going to have that time pressure with the wife. Definitely don't start it when you have kids. You know, that's just a nightmare. And so I've sort of broken all three of those rules. And, you know, it's a, it's a curse and a blessing because at the end of the day, it helps you perform at a higher level when you have some pressure behind you saying, look, you've got a family to feed. You've got bills to pay. It's not like you can just, you know, not get up early or not stay up late and, and finish that project that needs to generate income. And this is a business that has to be positive. It needs to be cash flow positive and it needs to be profitable. Otherwise, it doesn't survive. So it doesn't really allow us the leeway to make bad decisions and to take a bunch of really dumb risks or anything like that. It's sort of put the pressure on us to do a good job and make sure this business is profitable from the beginning. And the, the cool thing about that is I think you know, a lot of folks may be in that same position where they think, well, I would love to do this, but I'm just not in a life position that's going to allow me to do it. And there's countless examples, folks like you and me and lots of other people that are on this show that kind of say, no, that's not true. I mean, you can literally do this anytime. If you're willing to put what needs to go into it there, to put in the effort, the hard time and the sweat, uh, you can do it. You know, it, it can definitely be done. Yeah, I love those three rules, and I think I've broken them all as well. What I found of trying to balance this all out is it's forced me to be very efficient with the time I have, and I definitely can't do as much work as if I was single, but I think I prioritize work a lot better, and I'm more effective if getting the leverage point type work done. I basically say, look, I have to go out and get everything I need to do done by 1 p.m. each day if I can, because I don't want to bring the work home when it should be family time after that. So it really forces me to kind of crunch down and go for it during the morning. Yeah, and that makes you a more efficient entrepreneur. And one of the biggest things that the young, single, you know, like we're maybe looking at this and saying, look, man, if I was young and single, oh, it would be so much easier or something. But really, one of the biggest things that those guys are going to struggle with is burnout. And so by having a wife that's reminding you, hey, spend time with your kids, spend time, you know, off the farm, stop, you know, put the phone down for a while, like just pay attention. I think that's a lot more sustainable in terms of a business mindset of not just putting 24 hours a day into a company, um, having a little bit more of a longevity perspective on things and saying, look, there's the farm's very important. You know, it's one of the most important things in my life building this company, feeding people good food, raising the best food possible. It's super important to me. But at the end of the day, you know, my family is more important than the farm. And I think having that perspective has prevented me from just totally burning out. Because we do, we do, we work long days, hard hours. It's been pretty serious. And you're working long hours in the trenches, like you said, trying to get this all going. And your wife is supportive, but it's not her passion. You have a kid, you're leaving a salary working on savings, I know starting any business is going to have its ups and downs. It's that sine curve progression. Were there any dips where you thought, "Ah, I don't really know if this is worth it and I don't know if we're going to make it out? Oh, man. I never woke up and thought it's not worth it because every single day, one of the things that kept me driving all the time was that I really, truly deep down believe in what I'm doing. And so having that feeling when you wake up every day, I mean, it's a blessing, but it's also a curse because it makes it hard to balance out, you know, your work and your life a little bit. But yes, I mean, I remember times where I did not think that we were going to make it out. Um, I remember having 10 bucks in our bank account and we said, look, we're not putting any extra money to this thing. We capitalized it from the beginning, very measly $2,000, but we did capitalize at the beginning. So we're not going to keep putting money in this thing. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And so we'll, we'll move on with life. And I remember being down to like 10 bucks in the account, going to Home Depot to get some Ziploc bags or something for chicken processing. And literally like we couldn't buy them because we didn't have enough money. And it was like, Ooh, I think we might be done here, you know? And, uh, by the grace of God, really, we pulled it out and we're in a much more comfortable financial position, although we're still really, really scrappy, still starting up, but we do have more than 10 bucks in our bank account now. So that's good. What was the change? So you got down to that 10 bucks. You were doing something that drew the bank, the bank account down. And then you realize, okay, we have 10 bucks and you've turned it around since then. What changed? Well, that was back in the summer. Let's see. It would have been like the summer of 2013, I think, was our ultimate low point. So we had a horrible predator problem on the farm. Uh, we started out, and I think we'll talk about this more later on the podcast, but for folks who are from 
Oh, yeah, we started out doing chicken tractors for our birds, the Salatin style 12 by 10 chicken tra- tractors that was going really well. And um, we, we kind of decided we want to try out a day range system, which means the birds have somewhere to sleep at night. But then during the day, they're out and about and they do, you know, whatever they can free, complete free range all over the property. And um, to make a long story short, it just didn't work. So we lost a ton of birds. Uh, we lost a lot of revenue. We were selling everything we could produce. We just weren't producing well at all. So it was kind of a technical mistake, but it just about ended us. And we had to, you know, make a pivot. It was way too late. One of the lessons we learned from that is be very aware and make pivots when you need to make pivots. Uh, we stuck to our guns on that for too long and it almost killed us. Um, but as soon as we got the predator problem under control, you know, a couple months later, we got good numbers in the production again we got the market people are buying it and the, the account starts to build back up but that was a, a very very tough time I, I really thought that we were probably done within the next month or two i find those points really interesting where you really get your back up to the wall in a business and it's those times where you fold or you pivot and change and move on and for a lot of people those hardest times become almost like launching pads to much higher levels than they had ever seen prior to those hard times. I wanted to emphasize that and talk about that because I don't want people to give up at those points. Now, I think you have to critically evaluate your business at those points and say, well, maybe the business might be better to fold up, but also realize that maybe you could also pivot things to take things in the right direction. Well, look, you put your best foot forward you give it the best shot you got. You do as much as you possibly can, and that's all you can really ask of yourself. So, if at that point in the business we had to fold, you know, if we if we got a little bit farther down, I mean, you don't have too much farther down to go than ten, so you could go to zero. But if at some point we had no inventory left, no cash left in the account, and we would have had to fold, it would have been a big bummer. But at the end of the day, we would have made that decision, and it it's not like we would have been giving up. We we gave it our best shot. And it didn't work, you know, so maybe that's easier to talk about now than actually sitting there and doing it. That would have been really hard because you put your heart and soul into something um, and it's pretty tough to just give up on it. But, yeah, I totally agree with that. It's, it's a you never want to give up on something. And we gave it every possible thing that we could. And it really was a launch pad because from that point on, we got birds back into the tractors. Everything started working better. The soil was regenerating better. The birds were growing out better. Customer base started to grow again, and uh, and it totally took off from there. So that's kind of interesting that you say that because that's exactly how it happened. That was in 2013. Now we're in January 2015. We're almost February 2015. When did you guys start Primal Pastures? Was it 2012? Yeah, it's kind of tricky because we got our first ever batch of chicks. We got 50 chicks in April of 2012. So at that point, it really wasn't like a business yet. It was just a total hobby. It was kind of like an experiment. Hey, let's raise these birds. We don't know the first thing about raising birds, but let's YouTube it and, and Google everything and see if we can do it. Um, and so there definitely wasn't a business form there yet. Uh, our first sales were kind of starting to roll in by the end of April, uh, May. People were putting deposits down on the birds. So we really processed our first batch of birds probably sometime in like June. And then we ordered again. And I would say the business really started to take shape in early 2013, maybe like spring. Um, so we've been really at this for about two years. You're two years into it, and you had that major low point. Uh, call it two years ago. How good are you guys doing now? Like how much are you guys doing in sales now? Oh, we're kicking butt, man. It's it's really going good. The biggest thing is that we've got an amazing customer base. So we've worked really, really hard at developing a customer base that understands uh, we do our part to educate, but most of the time they're educating us. You know, it's one of those things. Uh, But we've definitely struck a chord here in Southern California, and it's an awesome place to be. Um, 22 million people within two hours of the farm, Uh, lots and lots of really smart people, people with a little bit of extra money. Although I will say our typical customer is not like a wealthy person. It's some who's working really hard for their money and that's that's decided to prioritize their spending in a way that's more on the healthy foods than, you know, maybe really nice car or big fancy TV or house or any of that stuff. So, but we have, we've definitely struck a chord with people and uh, we're, we're operating at a good level now. In 2014, uh, we were over 300,000 in sales. So for the second year of a startup, you know, that's pretty good. For the second year of a farm startup, that's totally leveraging 
you know, an asset heavy business, uh, it's really good when supply is your constraint and, um, it, they're, they're good numbers. They're definitely moving in the right direction too. Yeah, that's awesome. It's amazing that you guys are doing that. And I want to clarify too that sales are different than profits. Is what you guys do profitable? Yeah, we've been in the black since the beginning. Like I said, we've never taken out a loan. Uh, we had one friend put in a, a tiny bit of money, but we, uh, we've never gone to the bank. We've never taken an investor. We have 100% ownership in the company. We don't have any loans out, no debt on the books or anything. So it's actually impossible for us to go in the red. Like it's not, if we do that, we die. So um, that's one of the things that's been most important to us is keeping the balance sheet clean, which means keeping a lot of assets and almost no liabilities, which is uh, – results in a lot of equity if you kind of understand accounting at all. That's been important to us. So we've always been profitable. The degree of that profitability um, is really variable. So it's it's going up and up all the time. The important thing for us is that we were able to reinvest profits. So we would take, you know, if we make $5,000 in a month or something, we've been able to reinvest those profits into buying more chicken tractors, more infrastructure, walk-in freezer, delivery systems, all these different things that, you know, they're not really expenses. They're assets for the business that we can leverage to do more sales and more more volume in the coming months and stuff. But being able to reinvest those profits and not be in the position where we need to take every cent of profit for ourselves to be able to survive, that's what's allowed the business to grow into what it is now. Glad you guys are profitable because I love using you – in Primal Pastures is an example of somebody who's really excelling and doing this in a way that's successful because there's too many stories out there of farms that, one, aren't even profitable to start with and are you know squeaking by in 15000 or $30,000 in sales. And I wanted to have you on to really start talking about this to show that there's potentially big sales numbers on the table. It's possible and it's profitable to do it, and people that go in with this mindset that farming can only be a small money game are handicapping themselves from the beginning, I think. Yeah, I mean, my math equation, I know how to do math, trust me, but uh, my math equation is you got to be 100% focused on the farming, but you have to be 100% focused on the business, too. You know, it's uh, it's one of those things where you don't, it's 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 the 21st century, and especially for us, looking to sell direct to market, uh, we sell directly to consumers all throughout Southern California. We have no um, commercial accounts, no grocery stores, or uh, no restaurants. No, we don't even sell through farmers markets or anything. So you have to know your numbers cold. You got to know your margins, your top line, your medium line, your bottom line, what you're taking. You really, really have to be able to know your numbers cold. Otherwise, you're not going to be around for very long. I mean, it's really it's kind of sad. Um, I think that the, the day of, you know, growing a bunch of corn and soy and being able to take home a comfortable living off of that is quickly fading, uh, as commodity prices mess with everything and the, you know, the, the whole market's just kind of twisting. So I think to be a farmer in 2015, to be able to eke out what I consider kind of a comfortable living, um, it takes more than just planting seeds. You know, there, there's a lot more to it than that. Which is kind of crazy that we're even talking about this because at the core of it, it's a business and there's no other business with which you would approach it with a, call it a traditional farming mentality of just what you said, plant the seeds and it happens. I mean, any other business, if you look at some of these tech startups and whatever, I mean, it is cutthroat. You got to be on it, constantly innovating, constantly trying to reach the market, interacting with customers, providing a good experience, keeping your product quality high. I really agree with you that there's a lot involved on the business side, and sometimes I think way more effort needs to go into the business than the farming side because I think once you get that going, a lot of that, I don't want to say it takes care of itself, but it kind of starts running on its own cycle. Yeah, I mean, at least a little bit. And so for a lot of the folks that are out there, you know, that are saying, well, I'm just not business minded. You know, that's not who I am. That's not what I want to do. That doesn't mean you can't do this. It's really, really important to get people involved that fill in where you're weak at. So there's plenty of business people that would be willing to, you know, jump ship and provide their expertise kind of for some equity in the company or something. You just have to reach out 
for those people. And, and the same, if you're a business guy that really wants to get into this sustainable ag kind of space, uh, don't expect to be like the greatest farmer ever and to be able to do both. I mean, for us, it's definitely a constant daily battle of where do we spend our time, but I could definitely see, you know, a great partnership would be a really good entrepreneurial minded business guy combining with somebody who's well versed in permaculture that wants to be spending his time outside, you know, plant seeds and harvesting and doing all the stuff that is required on the soil side. So that's kind of like the perfect storm if you can combine those two things. Looking deeper into your business itself, you sell a lot of different things, but let's actually now just kind of focus on the poultry because I think that is a vector for a lot of people to get into farming. People want to do the pasture poultry. Given the expenses that go into producing a bird under good conditions, we're not talking CAFO here, we're talking out on pasture, whether free-ranging or in a chicken tractor, and given the low tolerance that a lot of the public has to pay higher prices, what are your thoughts on pastured poultry as a viable business? All right, so so to kind of kick off the thought process on starting in the pasture poultry thing. First of all, in my opinion, I haven't been around farming for that that long. Like I said, we kind of got our first chicks three years ago. I didn't have like a food related job before that, but I did have quite a bit of experience in tech. So I, I worked quite a bit in tech and uh, internet company startups, that kind of that kind of realm. Um, to me, pasture poultry is one of the best places to go product wise when you're starting a farm. Yeah, I was just listening to the Mark Shepard podcast, and it's like one of the difficult things about that is you plant trees, and you don't see revenue from that for years. That's kind of like, you know, you buy a, a calf or something, and it's going to take you a couple years before you can ever have that harvested and sell it and get revenue from it. The beauty with birds is, depending on the type that you raise, it's anything between like 7 and 11 weeks until you've harvested that animal, which is pretty fast if you think about the cash flow. Compare that to pretty much anything that you put in the ground. We're, we're at 11 weeks now because we're using more of a slow growing kind of heritage style bird. But in the beginning, we were using Cornish Cross and that was kind of a consistent eight weeks out on pasture, uh, turn around and sell it. And one of the cool things is we structured the business to where we're getting paid up front, not bringing it to farmers markets and sitting around unsold products. We, uh, we were taking deposits online. And so we were actually getting paid before um, we had to pay our expenses, which is really, really handy. Uh, the feed companies that we worked with, we were able to get scrappy and negotiate terms with those guys so that we were paying 30 days after delivery. Uh, that gave us a little bit of room on the cash flow perspective to basically finance the operation with almost nothing. Like I said, we put, I think it was $2,000 total into the business, and we were able to get our start in pasture poultry. It was really small, but the good thing is 50 birds – can be 25, 30 customers worth when you're first starting out. I think I even talked about this in the first podcast, like like podcast eight or something on the show, but the cash flow and the turnaround on birds is so much better business-wise, not only because you get it, your money faster, but you get so many more customers. If you're, you know, break down a beef and maybe you sell a whole beef or a half beef, you have one or two customers out of that deal and it took you two years. With chicken, you raise 50 birds, it takes you eight weeks, and you got 25 or 30 customers. So if you just think about it in terms of a business and cash flow, which is really important, especially when you're not backed by a big investor, that's stuff that you got to think about when you're starting a farm. Okay, so that's an advantage of doing the birds. You get the quick turnaround. You can get a lot more of them, less space. But for a startup, one complaint I hear about a lot of people that go to take on pastured poultry is the cost that goes into it. And I think, you know, call a, a saleable bird three pounds. Those three pounds could cost... 5 to $10 a pound is what you might have into it if you go all in, feed, marketing, your time, equipment, losses, all that type of stuff. So you have to have a viable market on the other side to do that. So that's where I'm, I'm kind of coming from. And I know here there's a viable market for that. But I know also that when you can go to Costco and buy 250 chicken, it's hard to to sell chicken at ten dollars that again that comes into marketing and we'll talk more on that later so that's why i wonder how how good is that business in the long term if your expenses are just that high 
uh, that's not a good business. If your expenses are higher than, you know, what you can sell the bird for, then that's kind of not even worth doing it. But I'll venture to say that marketing, one of the most important things about marketing is not trying to convince people that your product is, you know, this and that. It's really finding the people that already think your product is worth, you know, what you need to charge to make it viable. So a, a huge part of marketing is going out and actually finding these people and saying, hey, look, I have this, this thing that you're already looking for. Now here it is. And I think when you approach marketing more as, you know, trying to locate people that already believe in your product rather than trying to sell people that don't really care about your product, uh, marketing looks totally different. Um, so I would say that if you really, from a startup perspective, need to value your time at X dollars per hour, you know, the time that you spend going out and talking to folks. And I mean, you really, it's, it skews it too much to look at all that. So to me, when you're starting it out, look at the hard costs involved. Your time is sort of a donation in the beginning. And I know ranching for profit and some other schools may disagree on that point, but I think a lot of times they're looking at more of an established operation where I'm talking about really bootstrapping this thing from the ground up. So it's not that I'm saying don't value your time, but just know that to get this thing off the ground, there's going to be some soft costs that you need to put in it that you can't try to work into the equation. Otherwise, it'll never pencil out in the beginning. But as you get those economies of scale and you're producing a little more and you already have that basic customers, then it starts to make a little more sense on a time perspective. But let's look at the at the hard costs of producing pasture poultry first, because I think that's the money that's actually coming out of your pocket that you're going to have to have whether it's just like saved up or if, you know, you may be, I'm not saying you shouldn't ever go take a loan or an investor. Uh, it's just obviously preferable if you don't need to do that. But I think looking at the hard cost to start is, is really important. Let's look at that now for starting up. For somebody who wants to get into pastured poultry and if they want to produce broilers, what do you think is the minimum number of birds that somebody would have to raise to get going and have a viable business? And by viable business, I don't mean selling a few birds on the sign here or there. I mean consistently producing products to sell to customers on scale. Like I said, I approach a lot of this from a tech kind of bootstrap um, startup perspective. So I talk about how you can hack this whole world a little bit. And there's expenses that people will say that you absolutely need that you really don't. And there's stuff that folks will leave out, you know, a lot of times when they're doing these projections and everything that I think you really need. So to me, do the Salatin system. All right. That's a proven system. He's got a whole book about it, Pastured Poultry Profits. That's been the Bible for us from day one um, until we decided we want to do this Damer system and got our butts kicked. But uh, Pasture Poultry Profits, Joel Salatin system, run the chicken tractor. If you're not familiar, it's really, really simple. It's a 10 foot by 12 foot by two foot high, basically an upside down box. It doesn't have a floor on it. You raise 75 to 90 birds inside of that thing. Uh, it gets pulled to a new spot on the grass every single day. They're getting fresh pasture, grass, bugs, worms, and they're they're being supplemented with whatever feed that you decide that you want to market. For us, that's a soy-free, GMO-free, certified organic feed. Um, other people are doing everything from a conventional, you know, really, really cheap feed all the way up to corn and soy-free. I've heard of some people doing that for broilers. But for us, it's a it does have corn in it, but it's organic, soy, and GMO-free. Um, so I think let's start out by talking about this system. So I think the minimum viable that you should do is at least fill up one of those chicken tractors. So that's basically talking about ordering 90 chicks, um, 90 chicks. You can get them for about a dollar 50 at the store. So with that, you know, you're in hundred, 125 bucks or something like that. Um, next you're going to need to build your salad and pen. The number one mistake that I see people making in pasture poultry is building, you know, the Ritz-Carlton chicken pen all the time. I see it every single time, even from people that you don't expect to do it. I consistently see people going to the hardware store, buying all the fancy lumber, you know, getting all the nicest stuff. And I get it. We had that tendency in the beginning, too. But if you read Salton's work, he says, look, do not make this an expense. Go find scrap wood. Go find lumber that's laying around, borrow, you know, buy the bargain stuff as much as possible and just get the birds out there um, for a cheap price. Once you've got some profits into the business and you've had a couple of batches that have gone well, then sure, invest a little bit of money, make your pens a little bit better or whatever. But to me, try to get as much of those scraps for free. 
if you go to Home Depot and you try to build one of these from scratch with all the nice wood and everything else, it's going to run you probably about 250 bucks. But I mean, you could theoretically get it down to about 50 bucks in materials if you are being scrappy about it. And especially if you kind of have or borrow some tools and screws and everything else, there's really not that much uh, lumber that goes into it. So let's say kind of like 50 bucks for the pen. The feed is where it gets kind of interesting because there's a, a lot of money that can be saved um, on your feed bill by ordering more and more. So if you can get a pallet of feed, that that makes it a lot cheaper than, say, getting like a couple bags of feed down at the feed store. For example, if you want to go buy our feed from the feed store, you're going to pay something like 45 bucks for a 50-pound bag, which is almost a dollar a pound. Um, what we're getting feed for, buying it on the pallet level, is – 50 cents a pound. So a lot of this, you're going to see the economies of scale happen very quickly. But in the beginning, you really don't have enough birds to justify buying 10 pallets at a time or something. So let's say, you know, for better, or for worse, you either start with this high end. And, and again, we're using really, really high end, expensive, fancy feed. Um, let's say, you know, maybe 50 cents a pound would be a pretty reasonable number. Uh, to start out being able to get your feed for. So at this point, you know, you've got 175 bucks in on the pen and the chicks, and you're going to spend something like 50 cents a pound um, on the birds themselves. Since you've got, let's call it 100 birds, just to make the math easy, a bird is going to take about 14 pounds of feed, and at 50 cents a pound, you're looking at something like 700 bucks for food. So at that point, you're up to $875 in, and you've essentially got, you know, water, moving the pens, the labor, all that stuff. Just ignore that because it's pretty minuscule. But essentially, you're under 1000 bucks, and you've got 90 birds that are going to yield you about five pounds of pop um, ready to be processed, right? So they're still alive. But in my opinion, you should be able to produce – you know, under 10 bucks a pound when you're first starting out. And that includes the cost of that pen, which is not really, it's really not fair to include that whole cost. But, you know, let's say you're going to pay your pen off with your very first batch. You should be around 10 bucks per bird, you know, pre-processing, something like that. And then your processing is probably, what, five bucks out here? Processing really varies a lot. So for us, we've always processed by hand. And to be perfectly honest with you, that ends up costing us. Once you amortize the equipment, we have a, a scalder, a plucker, you know, the tables, the knives, everything that goes into that, and the labor that goes into that. We end up something like around three to four bucks a bird for processing. If you bring it to a USDA plant to have them do it for you, the numbers that I typically see thrown around are something in the three to five dollar range. So to me, processing is something like you know, four bucks to just make it kind of consistent across the board. Hopefully you can get it for cheaper than that. You can definitely get it cheaper for that once you start to scale up. But I think an all-in cost around 14 bucks to have packaged product is pretty reasonable. So say somebody goes out there and they're doing that and they're raising the bird and let's just say their process cost is 13 bucks. What advice would you have for somebody in terms of how to price their bird? Because they're inevitably going to have people saying, I'm not going to spend $20 on a bird. I'm not going to spend $25 a bird. And I, I know where you're saying, like, you got to go find the people that do it. But what what kind of words could you give to somebody to say, stick to your guns and, and, and sell it for what it's worth? Yeah, so here, here's one of the basics of business. Don't look at your costs for how you're going to price this product. It's actually irrelevant. I mean, obviously – you don't want to sell for below 13 bucks or 14 bucks or whatever we said you're producing for. That's pretty stupid. In certain situations when you have to do that just to get a market build up, maybe, but really never look at your cost for a basis of how you want to price the product. What you really need to go out and look at is where are these folks that are buying something similar right now? So for us, that basically translated to look, Whole Foods typically will have some form of pasture poultry in the store. They sell it for five bucks a pound. Okay. There's a one data point. Um, one of the things with them is, you know, it's a big company. It's not local. They're not doing organic feed. 
um, you know, there's, there's, they're selling a lot of different products, not just the pasture raised. So, but whatever, it's a data point, five bucks a pound. Uh, you go to the farmer's market, look around at some stuff. Maybe there's, I don't, I don't think there was a lot of other people doing pasture poultry at the time. Um, but maybe there's a guy doing free range or maybe there's like a local guy doing local birds or something. Okay. He's at four bucks a pound, you know, so then we got a couple data points. Now I go online, I look at a couple other folks, maybe not in my direct area, but I'm trying to find people somewhat local to me. You know, hopefully they got prices published on the website. If not, I can call around and ask what they're selling for or whatever. Maybe get a couple other data points. So this guy's doing, you know, 425. This guy's doing 550. And uh, at that point, I've got enough data points to kind of make a decision on where I want to go pricing wise. And so for us, that was basically the research that we did. And I said, look, I want to be within the range, but slightly higher than everybody because I want to position myself as a premium product. This is a product that you cannot get in the grocery store. It's the healthiest bird that's being produced in Southern California. It's, you know, a local product. It's coming from a small family farm. Uh, I want this to be, you know, ecologically and economically sustainable. So I'm going to need a decent margin on the deal, which margin is just the difference between your selling price and your cost. Um, and so we decided to price at 25 and that seemed asinine to us in the beginning. We thought, man, if we get one person to pay $25, we're going to be shocked, you know, but believe it or not, people came, people saw it, they saw it online or whatever, and uh, they were putting down deposits from the very beginning. So we kind of priced it to the point where, look, if people are willing to pay this, there's a viable business. If they're not willing to pay this, we will process the birds. We'll eat it, you know, we'll eat them ourselves for our family and we'll give them away to friends or whatever. And that's that, you know, it's not that big of a deal. It was a really pretty cheap experiment. And at the end of the day, you know, we would have been out what, like a thousand bucks. So it sucks, but it was a, it was the cost of running the experiment. Yeah, that's a good point there. And one other thing I want to touch on here with the birds is you mentioned that you started with Cornish cross and that's what Joel Salatin uses. And I think he's experimenting with heritage birds, but he's really only done Cornish cross because of the way they can put on weight what are your thoughts on breeds after having tried the Cornish cross and what you're trying now? We had good success with the Cornish cross. It wasn't really that big of an issue. Uh, it was really personal preference of why we changed over. So I love to see the birds out eating bugs and worms and picking and scratching and doing all the stuff that birds are supposed to do. Um, we had actually, we were producing for a little while and we ran a Kickstarter and the Kickstarter did really well, you know, got a lot of exposure. And we were contacted by a company called Freedom Ranger out of Pennsylvania. They said, hey, we love what you guys are doing, but you need to be doing heritage birds because your model fits heritage birds a lot better. Uh, they do a lot better in, you know, hot climates. They do a lot better in cold climates. They peck and scratch a lot more. They convert feed better. Um, they'll take a little bit longer, but, you know, you're not growing them in a grow house. So why do you care if they take a little bit longer? It's just a little bit of labor, a little bit more labor that'll go into it. But really, you know, 90% of the cost of raising a bird is in the feed. So if the feed conversion is going to be better, theoretically, you can produce for a little bit cheaper. Um, so I said, let us send you a hundred of them for free. You know, and that was like, wow, awesome. Let's do it. Uh, they sent them to us. We loved the birds. They were really out. Like I said, pecking and scratching. They were a lot more active than the Cornish cross. Um, it fits our company's vision a little bit better. of That slow growing, non-industrial, um, you know, they've got a lot more leg meat, a lot less breast meat. They're older, so they're, they're more flavorful. Uh, it's a little bit more of a unique cooking experience because you gotta cook that bird lower and slower. Uh, you can't just throw it on the barbecue like you can a big fat plump Cornish cross. Um, but the flavor's insane on the Freedom Rangers or any kind of s slower growing bird. Um, the way meat works is the older it is, the more flavorful it is, but also the tougher it is typically. And that's pretty much the same with any kind of meat. It took a little bit of customer education, but I think all in all, you know, the birds are so much more pleasurable to sit out and watch. They're not just sitting there with their heads in the feed tray, um, and it just fits our model a lot better. So I could see, definitely, I could see starting with Cornish Cross or a slow-growing heritage. 
where I see people getting into some trouble is when they go to the extreme of like the ultra slow growing heritage birds, like basically raising laying hens for meat birds. And with that, you're getting like a three pound bird after six months or something like that. And to me, that's a hobby situation. So there's nothing wrong with it. Don't get me wrong. If that's what you want to do, then go for it. But it's going to be tough economically to have something growing that slow. I mean, I could raise a pig faster than, than you could raise some of those slow growing chickens. So I would think either starting with a Cornish cross or starting with, you know, something like a, a heritage free freedom ranger that's meant for meat production is a good place to start. And I know you guys also raise turkeys, but on a smaller scale, what are your thoughts on turkeys versus chickens? What are, what are kind of the pros and cons of each? Well, what they say is it's a two-year learning curve for every different kind of animal that you want to do. So right at the time where we felt like, man, we finally got a good grasp on the chicken deal, we've got the tractors going, we're producing well, it's you know selling the product and everything feels good, we said, well, we've got this market. For birds, and we also sell lamb, pork, beef, uh, honey, hopefully very soon uh, seafood as well. But we said, well, why not, you know, become people's source for Thanksgiving turkey? So we started a batch, um, I think it was in May. We did the broad-breasted bronze along with uh, a bunch of slow-growing heritage birds as well, just as an experiment. Um, I'm not going to say it was a failed experiment because we definitely broke even on the deal. We worked with a partner farm, Rancho Shiraz. Uh, down in San Diego County, where we kind of started the chicks out, then we brought them down. They ran the turkeys in between their orchards, which was a really, really cool program. Um, but we just didn't we didn't have the production that we thought we were going to. We ended up losing a solid half of the birds that we started with um, in the brooder. They were really, really a lot different than raising chickens. We started them on a, a diet that was a little low in protein. A lot of this stuff is it's pretty technical, but it's it's the reality of doing poultry production is, you know, a chicken, totally different than a turkey, which is totally different than a duck. And you can learn intricacies within each one. Hopefully there's going to be some overlap and some similarity. But, you know, I think next year when we do turkeys, we'll do very well on them. We just had that first year growing pains. We covered our costs. We didn't lose money on the deal, but it wasn't really that profitable. The good thing is, People are going to be coming to you as their farm looking for th- their Thanksgiving turkey, and they're willing to pay really, really good money for the turkey. So while we're getting five to five and a half per pound for the chicken, we were like nine bucks a pound or eight to nine bucks a pound for the turkey, which is an awesome price. I mean, it really results in an expensive bird. We had birds that were going for $199 this year. Um, and we sold out of every last one of them. And I think that the reason that that's viable is that, you know, it's a one-time thing. It's like people, that's a, a centerpiece for the table. Uh, people really want to be able to sit down and be comfortable with that bird. They, it's a it's a great conversation starter when you're having guests over or anything, and you can talk to them, oh, this is from my, you know, local farm. It's uh, pasture-raised and soy-free and organic and all these different things, and that's really important to a lot of people. Um Depending on where you're at geographically, I don't know if you're going to be able to get eight or nine bucks a pound. That had a nice margin on it, especially if the production would have been what we thought it was going to be. Uh, that would have been a really profitable deal. But as with anything in farming, you know, we, we ran into issues and uh, we didn't lose our tails on it, but it wasn't like the most amazing thing ever. So I think next year it'll be a great complement to the chicken program. Do you see year round demand for that or is it really just a holiday thing for turkey? I do think that you could produce turkey year-round, um, especially if you had a USDA processing facility. And the reason I say that is there's a federal exemption on poultry processing where you're only allowed to do up to 20,000 birds per year uh, in your backyard. One of the biggest stipulations with that is they have to be sold as whole birds. So I don't know about you or anybody listening, but before I got into farming, I really didn't buy whole birds. Um, I was more of a, you know, buy, like, boneless, skinless breasts or like legs or thighs or, you know, a lot of chicken sausage, turkey sausage, those value-added products. Um, one of the big things that I would like to be able to get to is, you know, grinding this stuff up and doing some high-end turkey sausage I think would sell really, really well. Um, but right now we don't have that USDA processing facility. So I think we could sell a few turkeys every month for sure. Um, but 
realistically, I don't think we're going to shoot for year-round production until we have that USDA uh, capacity and be able to do the more value-add products. So you did have that facility where you could process these. What would be your thoughts, never having done it, on selling the actual bird versus all value-added stuff? Yeah, I think there's a market for both, but... If I just sit in a grocery aisle, which I do from time to time, and watch what people buy, normal American people, you know, that are coming into the regular grocery stores and see what they're taking home, uh, I would say that it's like nine times out of ten when people buy chicken, it's a value-add product, not a whole bird. So I think that by offering the whole bird, you're giving customers a cool experience where they're like, you know, it's a cool cooking experience. It kind of has more of that life connection where you're saying, look, this was an animal that was raised and it was a living creature at one point, And they can really think about the humaneness of our slaughter facilities and all that stuff. And that's good, right? It's, it's all good. But if you want to access a little more of the mass market, the fact of the matter is you're going to have to have a USDA facility to do value, value add products because that's just not the whole bird is just not what people buy. You know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. And I think, I guess it gives you options if you have it. I was talking to somebody from a really successful big farm in Canada and where they started really making a lot of money and taking the jump up, they were selling beef was when they started to do value add stuff because it helped them balance the carcass. They, they could sell their shin meat. And they, well, they would have trouble selling that is just cuts. So, but they could take that meat and then put it into sausage or hot dogs, and suddenly now they're value adding something that they would have trouble otherwise getting rid of. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a a reason why processed foods, for better or for worse, do well in the U.S. because they're a lot more convenient, they're easier to cook, they're a, le- a lot easier to handle. When you walk in and you buy a pack of boneless skinless breasts. That's an easy deal. You cut them up, you throw them in the pan, and you they're done in 20 minutes or whatever. Whereas with a whole bird, there's a lot that goes into that. You know, there's probably going to need to get it out the day before to brine it, and then you're going to have to prep it somehow. You're going to have to kind of slow roast it or cook it somewhat slow. And there's there's a lot more that goes into that than just popping a couple of chicken sausages into the pan or whatever. I, I definitely see where you're coming from on that deal. And the bottom line is right now we don't have – USDA processing capabilities. So thank God we have customers that are into it, that'll buy the whole bird. Um, they totally see the value in it. They'll make the stock with it afterwards and all that stuff. But um, it would open a lot of doors to have some USDA capabilities. So that's another thing where I say, look, a lot of times we get the flack that like, hey, you guys are in Southern California. You know, you have the best market in the world for, for selling this stuff. I say, yeah, well, that's true. Uh, we also are missing a lot of the ag infrastructure that you may have in more of a rural area. Uh, the closest USDA processor that is open and available to us is like eight, nine hours away. So we'd have to put those birds on a truck and literally drive them to Northern California in order to get them, just to get them killed. That's not even cut and wrap. So um, there's a lot of there's a lot of pros to being where we are, but um, there's, there's definitely a lot of disadvantages to it too. And you definitely are taking advantages of the pros and, and trying to work with the disadvantages as best as you can. I love how you're trying to go out there, too, and encourage more people to get out and do this. And I was going back through some previous emails to prepare for this, and you had a quote in there. One of my biggest goals in agriculture is to show the community that financial sustainability is as much a necessity in permaculture businesses as soil health. And we may need to ditch current perceptions of what it takes to succeed for a version 2.0 understanding of the market and opportunities. Can you elaborate on that? Yes, I I definitely still believe what I wrote you there. I think that, uh, you know, if, if you just look at what it's going to take to be successful in terms of farming from a sort of traditional standpoint, it's really about, even from a permaculture standpoint, it's really about putting the right things into the ground, focusing on what grows best within your climate, which is important. You know, don't get me wrong. That's that's all important stuff to look at. But I think another thing that's just got to be looked at is what's your market demanding locally? If you want to sell locally, but people in your local area have no value for chestnuts or mesquite, it's not going to really do you any good, you know? So I think it's just really important especially as a permaculture community, 
to get this thing to take off, we've got to look at what's in demand. What do people want? And then what can you grow in your area? And once you have a match between those two items, that's what we should be going after. It's not about, you know, it's great that the uh, oak savanna is really the ideal climate out here. But if you can't layer that with something that's really in high demand within our area, you're either going to have to find an external market for that or you're going to have to add something to that to that uh, whole biome that that is marketable and that's going to make sense. Yeah, I'm totally with you, and I think if you get too fixated on creating that perfect landscape that you want to see, you may never end up having anything out on the landscape because it's so far dated off. So I think it, it's way easier for somebody to take the route that you took and then layer on complexity and long-term systems onto what you're doing than I think to go out from day one and think very long term and, and do everything on a long term basis and then bring in short term cash flow at the same time. I think that's a hard route to go at it. I do too. I mean, and, and I can only speak from my own experience, but where a lot of guys, and don't get me wrong, I mean, I respect a lot of the people in this movement a lot. And I think that what they're saying is really, really important. But where a lot of guys are thinking, all right, step one, you know, buy land. Step two, key line step three plant trees step four you know all right stop like hold on a second let's figure out how to make this a business first because that's really what you're doing unless of course you do it on the hobby scale all bets are off i mean do whatever you want on a hobby scale but i'm talking about trying to start a permaculture business that's profitable that makes you money that makes it so that you can survive with this as your sole income let's look first at what's going to make you some short-term gains in order to be able to finance this stuff. Like I've been in this for, like I said, two years. And now we're, now we're looking at setting up key line design. We're looking to plant certain trees and to do windrows and to do all these, you know, ponds and swales and different things. But if we would have started with that, that, that stuff's not making you short term money. And so unless you're independently wealthy or you've got external financing, it's a, it's a tough place to start. You know, our starting point was step one. Buy chicks. Step two, learn how to raise chicks. Like there wasn't that much that really went into it ahead of time. We kind of said, look, let's let's do this thing. Let's start. Let's commit to it. And the first step in doing that was really getting animals that were going to turn a, a quick cash flow for us. One thing that gets left out of this equation is the most important or one of the most important parts of any of these businesses succeeding is a viable and cultivated customer base. And you guys have done a really good job at doing that. And in order to cultivate a customer base, you need something to sell them. So if you go this longer term model, you can promote a customer base all you want, but if you're not actually doing transactions, it's hard to build that up. Where if you are doing something short term to actually sell them, now you're building a customer base. And whether we like it or not, I think those customers are really the gauge of how your business goes into the future, and then you layer on the sustainability preferences onto that because they're going to dictate what they want. And rather than you assume that they're going to want X, Y, Z, you let them tell you what they want, and then you put that into your system. Yeah, I agree 120% on that. I think uh – it is so important to look at what's in demand and what your customers are actually willing to pay for. Line that up with what you're able to produce and what you're able to do, you know, on a small scale or medium scale or whatever you want to start out with and then really start from there. And, uh, you, I was just on a phone call with somebody this morning and, you know, talking about trying to get customers and how to gain customers and all this stuff. And the, the number one step in getting a customer is having something to sell that customer, right? Just like you just said. I mean, if you don't have anything to, to sell them, they simply aren't going to be within the customer base. So right now, Primal's got almost 2,000 customers, you know, and that's mostly because we've had these small batch kind of poultry centric business where we've got a lot of products to sell to a lot of people, um, and that's allowed us to get a really nice book of business. And again, that's that's what sustains our business: is that direct to consumer marketing and that direct to consumer selling. We don't have a big restaurant that accounts for 25% of our sales that if they drop us, we're suddenly in a hurt locker 
you know, it's a very sustainable model when you have direct to consumer business um, as a hundred percent of your business because the likelihood that ten or fifteen percent of those people that have been consistently ordering every month or whatever are all going to drop you at the same time, or even worse, fifty percent of those people are all going to drop you and not order that month is almost impossible. I mean, statistically, it's literally uh, near impossibility. So um, it's a it's a really sustainable model when you can start focusing on the customer. And then you feel, figure out what products are going to meet their needs and figure out what your skills are to produce the, those products. Yeah, I don't think a lot of people realize how important that customer base is. And you guys obviously do because you even talked about adding seafood to what you guys sell. And you're obviously not going to go raise the seafood and or harvest it from the sea. But you have a customer base that – believes in what you do, they buy into what you do, they want to support you, and they like the quality of your products. And what that allows you to then do is layer on products that you're not raising, aggregating from other producers that have the same quality or better and adhere to the same standards that, or the standards that you want them to adhere to. And then you can provide that to your customer base and all you're doing is essentially middlemanning it, and it turns out to be a win-win for everybody. Oh yeah, and I mean, we're a farm at the at the very first and, and the core of our business. We're a farm, but more than that, we're a brand. You know, so when you look at Primal Pastures, um, what the goal is for people to come on there and to be able to trust every single thing that we have in our store because they've most likely been out to the farm. We host a couple farm tours every single month. They almost always sell out. We've got 120 people at them. Uh, we get a lot of people out to the farm. We, you know, introduce ourselves, our philosophy. They really get to know us and be able to trust that brand so that when they come onto the website, it's not like going through the grocery store where you're, you know, reading the back of every single label, trying to figure out what the ingredients are. Oh, is this one actually pasteurized or is this one like, you know, just a fake label like free range or, you know, cage free or something like that. It's like they can come on. They know us. They know our integrity. They know that we're going to get the absolute highest quality stuff and we're going to be completely transparent about everything that we sell. And so they can come on and shop with confidence, you know. And then another thing that we focus on, making it convenient for the customer. So I think that one of the big flaws in modern day, you know, small kind of artisan style farming is that we think our products are just so good that people will go way out of their way to come and get them from us or whatever. And uh, that's one flaw that I think, you know, people have the best intentions, but at the end of the day, they're busy, they're working, they have kids, they have jobs, they have a life that they're trying to maintain. And as much as they might like and be willing to pay for your $25 chicken, maybe they just don't have the time to drive out to the farm or to drive to your obscure farmer's market or whatever to try to get that stuff. So focus on various ways to make that more convenient for them. Uh, one of the things that we launched was home delivery, and it's a beast. It's a whole different business almost in and of itself. But by doing that, we've also been able to expand our sales a ton um, because it's actually convenient for people. They can come in, uh, order online, and then we'll deliver it to their door You know, once a month. And that's been really, really huge for us uh, as we grow, too. We'll have to dissect that in another episode because I know we're kind of coming up short on time here. It's definitely one thing that you've shown that, that's worked well for you. I want to just kind of close this out with the marketing aspect. A lot of what we've talked about today has all gone back to marketing. The 2,000 customers you have now were all a direct result of a lot of the work that you've done trying to go get your name out there on various platforms, communicate your story, engage with customers, how much has marketing been a focus of yours over the last two years, would you say, compared to actually what you're doing, say, out on the land? Uh, it's been a huge focus for us. So if I had to split up the amount of time that we kind of spent doing farming, marketing, and general admin, like business stuff, I'd say farming has probably been 40 to 50 percent. General admin has maybe been... 20% and marketing is probably a good, you know, a quarter to 30% of our time that we put into it. The cool thing about marketing is that when you do it the right way, 
It's not expensive. It just takes time. But the marketing is absolutely critical, especially if you want to sell direct to consumer. I mean, and I think that direct to consumer sales are the bee's knees. I think you get the highest margin. It's the obviously the most profitable. Uh, people know you and they trust you and you've got, you know, control over pricing and everything else. So I think it's a great, great place to start. Just to give people a little taste, what's one thing anybody could do out there that you think would help their marketing that that's not going to cost them some money? I would have to say if I, if I was going to pick one really, really basic free one that you can do for me right now would be Instagram. I mean, Instagram is literally one of the easiest things that I do throughout the day. As long as you got some kind of a smartphone, which most people do. If you don't and you're farming, it's probably worth getting one. But as long as you kind of got a smartphone and you're on your farm, you literally, you're outside already farming anyways. So pull out your phone, take a nice picture. People love to feel like they're seeing, you know, photos from the farm. It's an awesome branding exercise. Um, you know, you can put it out there and you'll, you'll start gaining followers pretty quickly with beautiful kind of farm photos and it doesn't cost you anything. Um, there are some really cool tricks with Instagram on how to link within Instagram, how to get direct traffic, uh, within Instagram, how to kind of network on Instagram and get other people talking about you. But that's an awesome way. We generate tons of sales off of Instagram, um, and it's really, really easy and free. So it's pretty killer. Yeah, and especially given that platform that it's photo based, most farms lend very well to that. Well, especially we're we're talking about permaculture, right? So it's beautiful landscapes, it's things that people wish that they could be a part of. Like when I was sitting in my desk job, yeah, I would just sit and look through all the different farms. Instagram, it like takes you to a different place. Um and when you're doing things in more of a permaculture based mindset, a lot of times you're in a beautiful, kind of romantic, patriotic uh setting and I think when you can convey that to folks, it really, really builds on a brand. So I think that that's a, a great place to start. I love that advice. And one other piece of advice I'd have for people is look at the Primal Pastures Facebook page. Just take a look at it. See what they're doing. See how they're posting stuff. And I think you can kind of dissect and reverse engineer a lot of stuff from that. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a, been a crazy ride. We started our whole business really on Facebook. That was the original platform that we use to push information to people. Uh, We've really taken on the whole mindset of like the jab, jab, hook, which is, you know, at least four, you know, brand building kind of informational posts for every one selling post that you want to do. So the last thing you want to do is bombard people with, oh, you know, buy this, buy that, buy that. But they they love to feel like they're kind of part of that story and to be able to, to tell the more storytelling type of posts most of the time. And then to work in the selling posts every once in a while, it keeps things really authentic, um, and it and it ends up generating you a lot more revenue than just posting sales all the time. Or, you know, there's a lot of folks that just they're shy about selling on on Facebook too. So, a, a lot of folks I'll see that just only storytelling all the time. They don't really understand how to create a selling post. And I'll tell you, out of that three hundred thousand plus that we did last year in sales, it had to be. 150 of that had to come from Facebook at one point in time, if not more. So it's a major platform for us, a really, really strong one. But it's a little more intricate. So, um, yeah, definitely check it out. Thanks, Paul, for coming on to chat today. I love the work that you're doing. I love how you guys are kind of pushing the limits in terms of what's possible with farming. And I hate to say it, but legitimizing it because I think a lot of it isn't being done as a business and you guys are out there saying this can be done as a business and it can be done in a way that embraces a lot of the values that we all have. It respects the animals, it respects the land, and it respects the people involved. Well, there's a there's a handful of folks that are in the trenches trying to make something happen, and you're definitely one of those guys, Diego, so we always appreciate uh, you letting us come on and appreciate you know your friendship and and definitely look forward to working together some more there you have it paul grieve of primal pastures if you want to follow along with everything that paul is doing be sure to check him out on instagram at primal pastures and if you want to have the unique opportunity to learn from paul at his home farm here in Murrieta, california be sure to check out the growing your farm business mastermind workshop coming up this march 
At this very unique workshop, you're going to get a chance to learn how Paul and his family have grown their farm from something small to something huge, from marketing to production to aggregation to shipping product and home delivery. Paul's going to cover a lot in this one. He's going to teach on course material that he doesn't teach anywhere else. He doesn't have this material out there. So this is your one and only chance to learn from Paul. This is going to be an extremely exclusive workshop with only 30 tickets for sale and only a portion of those 30 tickets remaining. Limited availability means you're going to get the chance to get a lot of one-on-one attention and get your questions answered. If you want to take your farm to the next level and scale up, check out the Growing Your Farm Business Mastermind Workshop at grassfedlife.co. That's all for this one. Thanks for listening. Until next time, be nice, be thankful, and do the work.